Welcome to another module in our Random Forest series uh, for the Big Data Analytics Summer School of JPL and Caltech. My name is Thomas Fuchs. I'm a research technologist at JPL and a visiting scientist at Caltech. And in this module, I'm going to talk about cancer research. So besides space exploration, JPL actually has also a tradition in cancer research. JPL is managing the Early Detection Research Network for the National Cancer Institute and has several other initiatives in that field. From a machine learning standpoint, a lot of methods we actually developed and used for space exploration can also be used in cancer research. For example, methods for detection and segmentation we use for imagery from Mars. We also use these methods to classify and detect structures and histological slides for cancer. We worked in the past on bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and lymph nodes. Uh, in this module, I will show an example from kidney cancer, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. In general, uh, the application we are talking about falls into the domain of computational pathology. Computational pathology is a very new domain. It's defined uh, as the investigation of a complete probabilistic treatment of scientific and clinical workflows in general pathology. Especially, it combines experimental design, statistical pattern recognition, and survival analysis within a unified framework to answer scientific and clinical questions in pathology. So in practice, what do pathologists actually do? Where does our data come from? How do we get from tissue to our bits and bytes? So if pathologists get some kind of cancer, they cut it off, they put it in these uh, boxes where it's fixed in paraffin. Uh, then they cut off very thin slices from these paraffin blocks. These are then stained with different kinds of antibodies for different kinds of genes or proteins of interest. And then you end up with a nice collection of slides in all these different colors for different kinds of interesting reactions on the slides. And then, unfortunately, most of the time, they're just stored in analog form or in these huge archives where actually pathologists need robots to retrieve these slides. So it's genuinely a big data problem if uh, every single histological slide would be scanned in these huge hospitals, you would have 100 to 200 times more data than you would have in classical radiology. So you really need machine learning to do concept extraction, to get knowledge out of it, and to provide utility for pathologists. And then the last step nowadays is a very subjective one. The pathologist looks at these slides and decides what to do. So naturally, in practice, it depends on the uh, pathologist himself, what comes out, and the clinician decides based on the estimate of the pathologist if the, if the patient gets, for example, chemotherapy or not. So the goal of this machine learning problem is not only to automate tasks, but also to object, objectify them. So it's just in recent years that scanners got that good that we can actually scan these slides in a resolution which is comparable to what pathologists see in their microscopes. And here's an example of a mole. So the whole image is 150,000 times 50,000 pixels. So that's approximately the same size as the imagery we get from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. But on Mars, we are more interested in dunes and craters and volcanoes. Here's actually tissue composition and cell nuclei. So we can then zoom in. One can see the different layers of skin, different kinds of tissue already some uh, staining of cells. And then the last step is you can actually uh, cut out columns of tissue from these blocks and array them in a tissue microarray. And the goal is to detect this rounded structure, for example, estimate the staining. So for our example here, we end up with images for patients. So what you see on the top left is the clinical workflow. If a cancer is detected, they can cut out these columns uh, from tissue from single patients, array these columns in a paraffin block, 
Again, cut off very thin slices, put it on a microscope block, and then stain it for antibodies. And then when you scan that slide, you get one of these spots for every patient. So these spots are 3,000 times 3,000 pixels, and all these roundish structures you see on the right are cell nuclei. And one question to ask is, for example, how much of uh, the protein is expressed? So that's the, the brownish cells. Uh, on the right side, and that gives you, for example, in this case, since it stains uh, MIP1, that's a marker for mitosis, and if you restrict the classification to cancerous cells, it tells you how aggressive the cancer is. So, um, in practice, we use machine learning techniques like random forest on different levels in these experiments. On the lowest level, one is interested in subcellular accuracy, so where is the cell nucleus, where are cell boundaries, what kind of cell is it. On a higher level, one is interested in segmentation of histological slides, so you have a structure, you want to differentiate, for example, in lymph nodes, uh, different kinds of tissue, to then restrict, for example, uh, staining estimation to different regions. And in the last level, you want to actually quantify morphological structures. So in practice, the structure or the composition of the cell nuclei on tissue is enormously important. So for grading prostate cancer, for example, pathologists looking at the structure of the tissue still beat any biomolecular method. And then the last thing is uh, the importance comes also from the fact that regardless what kind of biomarker we would find in proteomics, transcriptomics, or metabolomics, at one point it has to be tested on human tissue. And that's where these tissue microarrays again come into play, and that lead to a clinical trial. In practice, the difficulty comes from a huge variability in these images. So you can see uh, H&E staining at the center, maybe one staining at the bottom, and you can see over staining, uh, under staining, you see torn tissue, and all these sources of variability can come from uh, biological sources, from technical sources, from pre-processing sources. And the next big thing is, so how can we actually train a classifier? We've seen in the modules before for the introduction of random forests as well as for the space exploration task, we need positive and negative samples. In this case, it's not trivial. So what is actually a cell nucleus? How does it look like? So that's something uh, I myself or uh, another technical person cannot solve. You actually need a domain expert to annotate imagery. So in the past, we've written tools to go to hospitals where doctors can annotate or classify cells using tablet PCs. We have online servers where doctors can do that, compare their performance, and also crowdsourcing uh, initiatives to get information about uh, these kind of cells or tissue structures. Based on that, we now can do machine learning. So at the top, you see cell nuclei and background, for, where, for which most of the pathologists agreed that it actually is a cell nucleus or background. What we do then is we train a random forest based on several features, computer vision features we extract around uh, points of interest, and then apply that in a sliding window manner over the whole image, so that at the end of the day, we end up with detected cell nuclei, and based on their color, we can estimate the staining for a specific patient. So what you can do here is we use a variant of a random forest. The features we use are very simple ones. You see on the left side, uh, we just sample rectangles randomly. We sample two random rectangles in the vicinity of a point of interest. So if the training set consists of the cell nuclei, we would extract a patch of image pixels around it, sample a rectangle, and then, for example, compare these two rectangles. We do that not by learning a threshold, but we just look at the relation. So is one of these rectangles uh, brighter, for example, than the other one? 
While this seems like a too simple feature, in practice we learn trees which are quite deep and combine hundreds or thousands of these features. And then you have also in different kinds of trees in the ensemble representing different subsets of that feature space. So you get a nice description of shape and it's also illumination invariant since you only look at the relation between these rectangles. In practice, we use Gini index as a cost function, as in the classic Ernum Forest paper. Uh, the Gini gain is a cost function. And another difference to the standard Ernum Forest is that you could not design actually a matrix beforehand where your array, your samples, and your features, as we saw in uh, the Ernum Forest example, because if you would array all possible combinations, of these rectangles, you would have nearly as many possibilities as particles in the universe. So what we do in practice is, during learning, we randomly sample 500 features, means 1,000 rectangles, do the comparison, which is done extremely fast since it's only a binary combination, and then choose the best one. And based on that, we can very quickly learn, and hence learn larger and more powerful ensembles, random forest classifiers, to do the task of detecting these cell nuclei. Then we classify every, every single pixel in the image. So what you can see on the right here is the confidence of the classifier if a single pixel is a cell nucleus or not. You can also already see some structure on the right side, while if you look at the left side, it's very blurred and washed out. So after detecting this nuclei, we now can compare our algorithms. So what you see on the right side is a precision recall curve, as we discussed in the previous module. And the red curve is the result of the random forest presented here. And what you see on the top right is the performance of two pathologists. So they also disagree, so it's not perfect, but it shows that the algorithm is worse than the experts, but comes close compared to competing methods. So the next level is now to characterize the nuclei we actually found. So we now use random forest to find these nuclei. Now we can use mathematics to describe different kinds of cell nuclei. So on the top left, there are some uh, characteristics are mentioned, like the difference between inner and outer intensity, the wiggliness of the boundary, and so on. Based on that, we again get a feature vector of several dozen descriptors, and can now use a random forest again to differentiate between cancerous and non-cancerous cell nuclei. And this actually completes the pipeline. So what we see here is the complete setup, at the top, we have uh, image acquisition, where tissue is extracted, tissue is stained and scanned. Then we get label data from experts, from hospitals. Uh, use that then in the center row to train a random forest classifier for detection. Then detect nuclei in the image and classify them as cancers or not. And in the center right, then estimate the staining. So staining estimation is quite robust. Brownish cells are stained, non-brownish cells are non-stained. And you end up with a percentage for a patient. So at the bottom row, now we can finalize that by applying this procedure to a whole set of patients. In this case, 133 renal cell cancer patients. And to do that, we need a cluster. So we use a computer cluster and use dis distributed manner classification. So that's also something where random forests are very uh, suited for because you can actually parallelize training and classification by training single trees, for example, at different cores or even different processes or different machines, and then combine the result. Also during classification, nowadays you always have multi-core chips. You can use these multiple cores, but just splitting up the trees over the course. So that's very straightforward way. And then on the bottom center, we compare the staining estimation over all patients with a domain expert, and then plot the survival of these patients. So you can see the final result here. These are Kaplan-Meier plots, 
On the x-axis, you see the month of survival, and on the y-axis, you see the cumulative survival. The patients are split up in two groups, a low-risk group, which has uh, not that much expression of this protein, and a high-risk group with more expression of this protein. And you can see that, for example, for the high-risk group, the probability of survival drops below 50% already after 40 months, whereas if you are in the green group, it takes 18 months. So the goal is to differentiate these groups of patients. And what you see on the right is the result of the algorithm. And this was the first time that we could show that a, a computational pathology framework can perform as well as a trained pathologist for doing this estimation task. And this is mainly due to the fact that random forests can be trained efficiently on a lot of data and can uh, robustly detect cell nuclei. So framing that problem as a detection by classification task uh, yielded much better result than classical approaches where you would do segmentation first and classification afterwards. The same procedure in the meanwhile has been applied to a lot of different domains, starting for as precursor for inferring spatial pros point processes, in uh, neuron brain imagery, top left, for pancreatic segmentation for type 2 diabetes, top right, for uh, mouse liver um, hepatocyte detection on the bottom left, or also for detection and classification in cell cultures. So thank you for your patience. And we will, in the exercises, we will actually use these examples and show you how to classify different kinds of cancer based on imagery and how to use random forest very efficiently, not only in space exploration, but also in cancer research.